Hi everybody, welcome to week 10, which means really we only have a few weeks left of the course. I hope that you've enjoyed this course as much as I have. Uh, I certainly have. And this week um, is no exception, I think, to the idea that we're going to be talking about stuff that is a little bit um, maybe controversial. And I, I set the course up this way to contrast these two movements uh, on purpose because they're both... Uh, fairly famous threads of thought in public administration, new public administration and new public management. You know, they're about 20 or 30 years apart from each other, but they have a lot in common and they have a lot of contrasts, but they've both been talked about an awful lot. So this particular lecture is really just going to be a broad brush of what your readings are about. I really... Um, would like to see you get into the readings. This week also is a week where I have uh, a journal assignment assigned. I'll get to that at the end of the lecture. And uh, again, though, I, I want to use this lecture kind of to introduce some of these ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, and then let you um, dive into the readings and, and explore the rest. So it, there's actually quite a few pages this week. Um, I need you to read the box text part five with the exception of that one reading 5.3 which I'm saving for a, a, a couple weeks later and then I'm having you look at some things uh, on both new public administration and new public management so on new public administration first I have this article by Fredrickson which was written in 1996 where he compares the reinventing movement or new public management with new public administration. Now, I have to tell you, Fredrickson might not be the most uh, objective observer. Fredrickson was really one of the scholars involved uh, in the creation of new public administration. So that compares both of them. Then then if you look, I, I have some um, readings that talk about each. So on the um, new public management or the reinventing side, I have an article by David Osborne. So he is, David Osborne is famous of the authoring pair Osborne and Gabler who wrote uh, Reinventing Government. This is a, an article that really just summarizes that, that book. Um, and then of course, President or Vice President, excuse me, Al Gore, um, launched something called the National Performance Review with uh, under the Clinton administration and actually the National Performance Review um, idea really continued under the George W. Bush administration with what is called PART. <coughs> Excuse me again. And anyway, Gore was heavily influenced by Osborne and Gabler uh, when he wrote this particular article. And you'll, you're going to see that, I think, in both those writings. And then I have this uh, optional article by Kim et al. called The Legacy of Middlebrook. That is actually a the um, intro to a book there by O'Leary, Van Slyke, and Kim called The Future of Public Administration Around the World, The Minnowbrook Perspective. And I keep talking about this idea of Minnowbrook. And I will tell you that in, um, in the box readings is another article by Fredrickson which links uh, more information about new public administration. So this idea of Minnowbrook is going to come up again and again this conference that occurred in 1968 and um, I, I want to talk about its importance. Okay so new public administration is is this idea really philosophy of public administration that came out of this Minnowbrook conference and actually if you just googled the Minnowbrook conference you'd find a lot of information even still as Fredrickson refers to um, later on. And so, but what did this come out of? Well, what this really came out of was this turbulent decade of the 1960s. So, um, you know, the 1960s was, a, was really a watershed of history in the United States. We had this unpopular war in Vietnam, which the United States just, in retrospect, you know, historians will tell you that the United States just sort of accidentally stumbled into, um, and it became the focus of, of a lot of the protest movements during the 1960s. At, at the very same time when President Lyndon Johnson had been pursuing 
his civil rights legislation and his uh, war on poverty legislation. So the Johnson administration ends up with this unpopular war growing in unpopularity at the same time he's trying to really change the social contract in America. During the 1960s, we see the recognition that civil rights had been officially denied to African Americans, at least in the South, under the Jim Crow laws, and probably in the North, to a very large extent. That, I mean, by that I mean that even though African Americans had been given, you know, the vote, for example, with the 15th Amendment post, uh, post-Civil War, really the Jim Crow laws in the South found ways to deny the vote until the Voting Rights Act was passed under the Johnson administration. Um, and so there was a contention among young scholars that academia really was part of the problem as they saw it, not part of the solution. A lot of political scientists and PA scholars, uh, they saw that PA was focusing on institutions and bureaucracies and that traditional public administration was seen as continuing to stress that there was this idea of neutral competence or almost, you know, continuing the politics administrative dichotomy in, in spite of what Waldo had written about and that that was preferable to some form of activism on the part of public administrators. And in fact, uh, one of the young scholars, Savage, uh, said that traditional scholarship represented, represented old men talking to old men about irrelevancies, old men out of touch with the real problems of a chaotic and dangerous world, and the youth who would have to deal with them. So there was very much a kind of a divide among scholars in PA and political science. So there was this conference called Minnowbrook. Um, and Middlebrook is the name of the conference center at Syracuse University in New York. Um, and this is what Fredrickson has to say. And you can do this. You can actually look Middlebrook up on Google. He said, if coverage on Google and Wikipedia are marks of status, the Middlebrook conference is iconic. As a broadly based critique of public administration, the Middlebrook perspective is an enduring legend. And there's this book called The Middlebrook Perspective. Uh, it's written by um, Marini is the author's name, and he was one of the, those young scholars. So this conference really consisted of about 33 young scholars. Uh, They're all males, by the way, which is interesting because there's been a Minnowbrook 2 and a Minnowbrook 3. They've all been about 20 years apart. And, and obviously scholarship has a lot more equality in it now, um, and academia does. A lot more women have been involved. But at the time, they are all men. They are all young men. Um, who saw themselves as wanting to question traditional PA scholarship. The Middlebrook Conference itself actually started almost inadvertently. There was an article by a man, a scholar named John Honey, in 1967. He wrote an, an article called Higher Education for Public Service. So I've read this article, and you know, all what he was doing was he was looking at the state of PA and trying to come up with some uh, standards for uh, the education of PA. Well, his article spurred a lot of protest, including uh, that comment by Savage that I referred to on the last slide. Um, this group of young public administration and public or uh, political science scholars took issue, uh, you know, less with his conclusions about public uh, higher education than his going in assumptions. Um, so it was said that public administration was asking the wrong questions, um, that uh, public administrators should be less concerned about efficiently running programs like NASA's Apollo program, which was going on at the time, the race for the moon landing, and uh, whether or not the Department of Defense was being run efficiently, but whether the programs themselves are even the right program. So in other words, they were saying that what public administration scholars ought to be asking in their view was, you know, should the government even be doing this? And they said that first, as scholars, we need to ask about the nature of the problem and then determine how we can solve it and not rely on um, talking about institutions and bureaucracies first and then figuring out the problems. And finally, uh, what Minnowbrook did coming out of Minnowbrook was uh, these, these young scholars said that efficiency as a normative value is not enough. 
um, they insisted that we have to add equity to this list of normative values, efficiency, economy, and equity in public administration. So this was Minnowbrook, and as a matter of fact, I have to remind myself over and over, this is a survey course, and we really just brush on a lot of these topics, but Minnowbrook itself is just a, a wonderful topic to explore. Um, you could look at that book by Marini, it's a good book. Um, and couple that then later there's some other books like the book by O'Leary that I refer to uh, as we start out this lecture that's the one where I quote Kim um, that's another good book and you can really learn a lot about really sort of a seismic shift in public administration but let's shift forward about 20 years or so to the um, the context of new public management so you know now, if, if the 60s and the 70s, early 70s, were an era where government was seen as the solution to problems, and they, that certainly was the case with President Johnson's um, welfare programs with Medicare and Medicaid, um, and with a lot of the civil rights legislation that passed under the Johnson administration, government was seen as the solution to longstanding problems. But fast forward to about 1980, and this is from Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address. He said, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. Um, so what happened, you know, in, in that decade and a half? Well, there was a, a loss of confidence in government institutions, especially following the Vietnam War, following the, the Watergate uh, uh, debacle and the Nixon resignation following really sort of lackluster Ford and Carter years, the Iranian hostage crisis, which still haunts us. Um, you can, you know, the, the former American embassy in Tehran is a museum to American imperialism. That is actually what it's called in Iran. And, and the failed rescue attempt, um, the long period, there was a very long period of hyperinflation and really a loss in the real value of wages and so <clears throat> government was was starting to be seen as the problem. You know, their well-intended government programs were seen as creating dependency status for beneficiaries. There's a scholar named Charles Murray that you might want to look up. He's very famous for uh, this thesis that, that uh, a lot of well-intended government programs create uh, a dependency status. And about this time, we see a growth of confidence in market-based solutions, not just in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mar uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is very famous here as a contemporary of President Ronald Reagan, and as well as in Australia and New, Zeal New Zealand. And so <clears throat> we're, we're seeing this idea that, that the market can take care of some of these problems that government can't. So... PA during this period is seen as part of the problem and bureaucracy bashing is really I call a popular sport and you know I refer to a couple of writings by John Rohr earlier in the class actually John Rohr wrote a couple books in the 80s and 90s that that really refer to this um, and this is actually where John Rohr starts talking about the legitimacy of public administration um, and so we also see during this time not just in the public sector, but in the private sector as well, right? We, uh, you know, we see uh, the book by Tom Peters, In Search of Excellence. We're starting to see an emphasis in both uh, the private sector and the public sector on flattening organizations and driving out bureaucratic solutions to problems in favor of kind of entrepreneurial market-based solutions. So this was the context of the new public management. Well, interestingly enough, um, NPA, as we'll call New Public Administration, and NPM, which we will call New Public Management, are actually not necessarily incommensurable. I mean, they, they are not total contradictions of each other, and that's kind of a, a take that a lot of people will give you the impression. They're, they're not. I mean, both NPA and NPM, they note that administration through bureaucracy has failed. So in each case, NPA and NPM, and you will see this as you read these articles. Um, you will see that the the enemy of the goods that each of these uh, philosophies 
advocates is bureaucracy. And so they both, in my opinion, both present something of a straw man of classical public administration in order to advocate their new view. So in, in each case, in my opinion, again, they, they each set up this sort of Weberian notion of bureaucracy and they say, look, this is how public administrator, administrators typically think and we have a new and better way of thinking about public administration. And they both, I think, suggest, uh, both NPA and NPM both suggest that managers and leaders can make a difference. Now, they come about it in different ways and they have a different idea of what this manager or leader should look like, but they both really lend support to this idea that management, that leadership makes a difference in public administration. So I get this right out of the Fredrickson 1996 article, and this is what he talks about, how uh, new public administration and new public management or reinvention contrast with each other. And so you see over here on the left, new public administration and on the right, new public management. So he says that in new public administration was prompted by this idea that there was too much trust in expertise and organizational capability and too little questioning of bureaucratic ways. So time out there, just think about this for a second. Go back all the way to Luther Gulick and Pazdekorb. What was Gulick talking about? He was talking about building up an expert organization um, and having organizational capability. So the Brownlow Commission, which, or the Brownlow Committee, which we talked about, and then later on there's the Hoover Commission. Um, what those those committees and commissions talked about was really uh, executive government, right? Uh, but but more than that, sort of an expert executive government. And so having faith in building up this kind of perfect bureaucratic organization. But the NPA scholars said, no, there's too much faith in that because it, ultimately it doesn't really work necessarily. New public management, the same thing. They just said that bureaucracy was bankrupt. To sell reinvention and, and um, new, public, new public management, to sell reinvention, Osborne and Gabler tell a lot of stories in their book. I'm, I'm not, I don't mean stories as in lies. They just tell a lot of stories about, they have a lot of stories about entrepreneurial managers who overcome bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is bankrupt. Um, in new public administration, they say that flexibility has to be the way things work. So what, what new public administration is saying is that change is inevitable. Change is a part of uh, life and change is a part of the environment. So really we need a public administration that adapts to turbulence. Um, it's not so important what kind of structures we, we form to adapt to the turbulence. What's more important is just adapting to turbulence and recognizing that turbulence is a given. Um, and so similar to that, uh, the reinvention people say that innovation and entrepreneurial activity are something that should be a constant. So every manager, uh, every employee really should constantly be looking for ways to innovate all the time. Innovation and entrepreneurial activity should be a constant. Uh, back again to new public administration on the third bullet there. What they said in the late 60s was that there wasn't enough concern for citizen demands and needs. So in other words, they criticized sort of this classic public administration and said, hey, look, all public administrators care about is setting up a bureaucracy that they hope will meet citizen demands. <laughs> We don't know, really know for sure, but we hope it will. What they're saying is what we ought to do is listen to what the citizens want first and then form our organization that meets those demands. Again, new public management says we should empower customers. Now that word customer is very important because they see citizens as customers. And this is one of the, this is one of the division points between NPA and NPM is this idea, are they citizens or are they customers? In both cases, they're both saying that these humans, whether we call them 
citizens or customers should be empowered and we should listen to, to their demands. Um, and so finally, New Public Administration criticized classic PA because they said there was an over-optimistic view of what government can or should accomplish. Um, and they said, no, government can actually accomplish more, but what we have to do is, is free up the administrators from the bureaucracy and we have to listen to citizens and then we can accomplish more. What N New Public Management says is that we can accomplish more if we individually empower people, if we individually empower uh, leaders, administrators, workers, and customers. So also in the Fredrickson article, he talks about six different elements, and I'm only going to talk about two or three of them here, but um, because I want you to really get into the reading and, and understand what, what's being said, but I want to kind of give a broad brush of some of these topics. So, um, you know, new public administration is really process oriented. So, um, you know, it's, it's equity oriented, but it's process oriented because what these scholars wanted to, to do was to somehow establish public administration as the institutionalization of change. Um, and so what you do is you build strong processes that are resilient and adapt to change um, because you know change is always going to happen. Uh, and so you not only recognize rapid social changes, but you act actually capitalize on them by involving citizens. And that uncertainty will bring about incremental change, but it could also bring decremental change. That is to say, um, if something's not working, you know, just go back and try again. Um, the, the NPA scholars would tell you that we don't have to recognize any particular bureaucratic structure as, as sacred or set in stone. We can go backwards if it means, if that helps us solve a problem. On the other hand, um, the, what new public management really is grounded in is sort of what I call a best practice orientation. So they have these series of, there's really 10 of them, but they have they, these series of sayings and you could almost see these as, as proverbs. So they say that managers should be concerned with steering rather than rowing, that um, we should empower people rather than serve them. And this is kind of where the customer orientation comes from, right? We should empower our employees and we should empower citizens. We shouldn't look at this as public service. We should look at this as citizen or customer empowerment. We should replace bureaucracy as much as we can with the market processes. We should meet the needs of the customers, not the, the bureaucracy and the people that work in it. Um, we should be earning rather than spending. Really, what, what the heck does that mean? Really, you know, it means that the instead of worrying about how much our bureaucracy gets, we should actually be trying to create value for the public. And there's a very good book by Mark Moore, which is a public management book called um, Creating Public Value. That was written in 1996, around uh, the same time that this is very popular. Um, we should be interested in prevention rather than curing ills. So, you know, if some of you have read uh, any TQM literature, you know that uh, one of the big things that TQM stresses in, in an industrial process is that you should prevent error rather than always fixing error. So that's, that's what this is talking about. And we should be moving from hierarchy to participation and teamwork. Pardon me. They said there was nothing wrong with these first two statements on efficiency and economy. So this was a classic question in PA. How can PA offer more and better services with available resources, right? That's efficiency. And how can service levels be main maintained while spending less money? That's economy. But what they said also was that, does this service enhance social equity? So they said, you know, we should always add equity to efficiency and economy. We should strive for citizen participation and participation from civil servants, and we should strive for citizen choice. And this is what makes uh, PA relevant. So instead of, you know, the citizen simply being this passive vessel that receives the, 
the services from government, they should be involved in what those services are shaped like. So NPM is a call for empowerment, for customer empowerment, as they call it, for public employee empowerment, and for customer choice. And so here again, it's this idea that there's this public choice idea and that citizens are really customers and they have a choice and they should, we should structure our, uh, we should structure government services such that they can make the choice that's appropriate. And so finally, the last one I wanted to hit on here was management and leadership. So really both, um, both of these uh, ideas, both of these philosophies are calling for changes in management and leadership. And when, when we get to the, the journal and the discussion, you'll see that I want you, I want you all to talk about management and leadership a little bit more. So NPA is a call for effective professional public service. It's a call for democratic, uh, for a democratic public workplace, and it stresses job satisfaction and a sense of mission. On the other hand, kind of a different take, NPM is a call for public managers to overcome bureaucracy through entrepreneurialism. It's a call for empowered employees and for enterprising employees. And I didn't put it there, but for empowered customers as well. Um, so this is how th these philosophies view management and leadership. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about values because Again, I stressed it, but it, but it's important to stress again. So NPA was a conscious effort by these young scholars, really, um, to address democratic government, to address majority rule with minority rights, and to address, to address the importance of politics in the allocation of benefits and public goods. So, you know, the political process does, to a great extent, allocate benefits and public goods. NPM claims sort of an apolitical stance. Um, the advocates of NPM and for reinvention say that, you know, efficiency in government itself is a neutral idea, um, that all managers should strive for efficiency. Um, that the key to better government is managerial excellence. But, you know, in a sense, this argument ig ignores the idea that politics is essentially a contest of allocation. And so how does, you know, how do you make something more efficient? Uh, do you do that at the expense of another program? That's kind of a question that, that gets asked by uh, Fredrickson in this article. And so here we are almost 28 minutes into this lecture. Um, and here's what I want you to do with this. You know, as I say, my, um, my lectures really are just a broad brush of what you can read. There's quite a bit of reading. There's quite a bit to absorb. And so here's what I want you to talk about this week. Uh, there is a journal assignment this week, and, and that's the question there. Based on the readings that, that both describe and contrast new public administration and new public management, please use this journal to reflect on how each of these philosophical viewpoints influences the practice of public administration as you understand it. So I go on and talk about some things you might want to consider. I want you to talk about in this journal, I want you to get into the readings and, and examine what these authors are saying about these sometimes complementary, sometimes contrasting points of view, and then think through how you think this influences the practice of public administration. You know, where you're working, where you see other people working, what do you think these things say about the practice of public administration? I mean, are they both still valid? Are they both still applicable? Um, do they overlap? You know, do they conflict? So think about those kinds of things. And then in the discussion assignment, what I want you to do is write a, another short discussion essay that contrasts the role of the public leader or manager within the philosophies of new public administration versus new public management. I talked about that a little. I gave it a real broad brush. There's a lot more in in the writings, in the readings, I should say, about those things. So what I want you to do in the discussion is talk about leadership and management. Um, there's a hidden question there, too. Um, so think about that for the discussion. Um, so again, here's, here's the um, 
references for this week. And while you're looking at this references, um, just let me remind you, I did put an announcement on the Blackboard site um, that talks about a little change I made to the syllabus concerning weeks uh, 13 through 15. Please read that, and it does change the readings a little bit. So I'm looking forward to another good week of good discussion, and I'm looking forward to your journals. Thanks a lot.